I again. In Kenneth Scott Latourette, History of Christianity, page 169, Latourette has been discussing how the bishops of the great churches of Christendom had to take sides in the issue of the correct interpretation of, of who Jesus Christ was and how did the Logos principle and, and Christ's true humanity, how did these things work together? And they disagreed. So we have in the last section Nestorius, the bishop of Constantinople, differing with Cyril, bishop of Alexandria, and how the bishop of Rome, Celestine, and the bishop of Antioch got involved, and all of the bishops being brought together at the council in Ephesus in 431, the so-called Third Ecumenical Council. Nestorianism, though, was not conquered, even though uh, he was by this time marginalized as as a, as a main player in the discussion, Nestorius, that is. So, Latteret begins this section, Nestorianism finds a refuge in the Persian Empire. Nestorius was not entirely to fail, when once he was safely out of the way and John and Cyril were reconciled, the latter sought to bring about the condemnation of Diodorus of Tarsus and Theodore of Mopsuestia, now dead, whom he charged as authors of the Nestorian heresy. In this he was aided by the bishop of Edessa. Moreover, Armenian monks with monophysite tendencies came out vigorously against Theodore. John of Antioch, as might have been expected, rose to the defense of Theodore, and the emperor, presumably at his instance, ordered that no one should be calumniated who had died in the communion of the Catholic Church, thus supporting John. There were some, including bishops, who held views akin to those of Theodore and Nestorius, who refused to subscribe to the creed through which Cyril and John had composed their differences. Because they were regarded by the imperial authorities as disturbers of the peace of the church and thus of the realm, they were exiled. A number of them sought refuge in the Persian Empire. Among them were several who found a home at Nisibus, the chief training school for the clergy in the Persian domains. Eventually, many of the leading ecclesiastical posts in that realm were filled by their students, and after something of a struggle, their doctrines became the accepted teaching of the Mesopotamian Persian church. That church now tended to regard the Catholic church as heretical. This was of advantage to it, for ever since Constantine had espoused Christianity, it had been looked at askance by the Persian monarchs as a possible supporter of their chronic enemies, the Roman emperors. The Mesopotamian Persian church could now affirm that since its ties with the church of the Roman Empire had been dissolved, that fear was baseless. It is said that on this ground, one of the Sasanian monarchs of Persia decreed, decreed that Nestorian Christianity should be the only form of the faith granted official recognition in his possessions. How far the teachers of Nisibus dissented from what was endorsed by the Catholic Church is debatable the variation may not have been as great as has sometimes been said. Whatever the degree of the difference, the Mesopotamian Persian Church came to be known as the Nestorian Church. As we have seen and are to see in later chapters, it was the means of an extensive eastward spread of the Christianity which in subsequent centuries carried the faith to the shores of the China Sea. The influence of Nestorius, therefore, did not disappear with his pitiful death but was felt across the vast reaches of Asia. Now his subhead is the continuation of the Christological controversy, the robber synod of Ephesus and the council and creed of Chalcedon. So long as Cyril of Alexandria and John of Antioch lived, the peace which had been effected between the theologies which they represented was fairly well preserved. However, that peace proved to be only a truce after death had removed them from the scene, a struggle broke out with renewed fury. Here were two tendencies which could scarcely be reconciled. The one, represented by the scholarship which had been strong at Antioch, stressed the historical study of the gospel records of the life of Jesus, and had hence made much of his humanity. The other, with its traditional center at Alexandria, interpreted the scriptures allegorically minimized the historical and therefore the human side of Christ, and gave great weight 
to the divine in him. It was in part an outgrowth of the position of Athanasius that had been carried further by Cyril, even though the latter had anathematized its extension in the form represented by Apollinaris. As we have suggested, the tension was heightened by rivalries between the great seas of the Orient, especially between Alexandria and the new Rome at Constantinople, for from the standpoint of the former, the latter was an upstart. Moreover, Constantinople made itself conveniently obnoxious <laughs> by drawing a large proportion of its bishops from men trained in the Antiochene tradition, that is the tradition of the Church of Antioch. In 444, Cyril was succeeded at Alexandria by Dioscurus, a man fully as zealous as himself for the prestige and theology of his see, and who went beyond Cyril in emphasizing the divine nature in Christ. In 446, Flavian, whose sympathies seem to have been with Antioch, was placed in the bishop's chair in Constantinople. Conflict soon arose over a monk of Constantinople, Eutychus, Eutychus denounced as Nestorian the Creed of 433, in which John of Antioch and Cyril had reached agreement, and declared that before the union, the incarnation that is, there were the two natures, divine and human, but that after the union, the incarnation, the two so blended that there was only one nature, and that was fully divine. In other words, Jesus Christ was homo usion, with the Father, but not with man. Eutychus was denounced at a synod in Constantinople in 448, over which Flavian presided, was excommunicated as a reviler of Christ, and was deposed from every priestly office. Eutychus presented his case to the emperor and to a number of bishops, including the Bishop of Rome. Flavian also wrote to fellow bishops, as was the custom in the Catholic Church, among others, to the Bishop of Rome. The Bishop of Rome was one of the ablest men who have ever sat on the throne of Peter, Leo I, Leo I, that is, Leo the Great. Leo supported Flavian and sent him a long letter, known as the Tome, in which he set forth the view which had been generally held in the West, and which had been clearly stated by Tertullian years before, that's actually more than two centuries before, that in Christ Jesus there was neither manhood without true Godhead, nor the Godhead without true manhood, that in Christ two full and complete natures came together in one person, quote, without dis detracting from the properties of either nature and substance, end of quote. Dioscurus sided with Eutychus. The emperor called the council of the whole church to deal with the issue. The council convened at Ephesus in 449. Dioscurus presided and was dominant. Leo was not present, but was represented by two legates. His tome was denied a reading. The gathering professed allegiance to the Creed of Nicaea by a large majority declared Eutychus exonerated and deposed Flavian and some of his supporters. Dioscurus excommunicated Leo, that is the Bishop of Rome, and appointed an Alexandrian priest in his stead. It is not strange that in circles loyal to Rome, the council was dubbed the Robber Synod. More about the council, the, the great council that follows, the fourth ecumenical council, the Council of Chalcedon, in the next segment. I'll put in a link to Louis Burkhoff's uh, discussion of this period of the development of the Trinity Doctrine, the first video in a, in a series that are linked on the development of the Trinity.